Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're continuing our Battles of World War II series with a pair of air battles in the South Pacific. Uh, these battles are part of the Solomon Islands campaign and uh, they are the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, which does not involve any German battleships, and Operation Igo. Now before I continue, um, the museum is going to close on Labor Day. We have not raised enough money uh, over the summer, which is normally our busy season, to continue to operate past that point. In addition to closing, all staff, like nearly all staff, are going to be furloughed uh, for up to six months while the museum is closed, waiting for the next busy season. Uh, because of that, our daily YouTube videos may have to come to an end. I don't want that to happen, so uh, in the description below is a link to a GoFundMe account in which we're trying to raise $20,000 uh, to continue the YouTube channel while the museum is closed and do other education things. Uh, if, if you like what we're doing, and would like to support the museum and our channel, please continue, uh, please consider supporting us. So, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea and Operation Igo are a pair of air battles which uh, show a lot of differences between American and Japanese uh, intelligence, uh, by which I mean their military intelligence, their acquiring of information, not individual personal intelligence, uh, and of their planning and preparation and how they carry out raids. Uh, these two battles took place in March and April of 43, after the Japanese had withdrawn from Guadalcanal, but while there was still a considerable amount of fighting in the South Pacific area, uh, namely around the southern Solomon Islands and uh, the island of New Guinea, so, uh, the first was the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. The Japanese had a major base at Rabaul, uh, and they had they were fighting MacArthur on New Guinea. And MacArthur had an allied force of Americans, Australians, and New Zealanders uh, in New Guinea, and uh, the Japanese wanted to set up a line of defense at uh, a place called Leh. Uh, and they needed more troops there to stop the Allied advance. So they just had to get these troops from Rabaul to Leh. Not particularly far. Um, however, Allied air forces in the area had been getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, and the aircraft had really good capabilities when it came to attacking uh, transport ships. So the Japanese war-gamed out the, their transport mission and they came up with about a 50-50 chance for success, uh, which is pretty low when you're talking about the lives of 10,000 or more of your troops. But they absolutely needed these troops in New Guinea uh, to try and hold the line. So they decided to go forward with it anyway. They picked eight transports uh, to hold approximately 8,000 troops, uh, and they were going to be escorted by eight destroyers. And uh, as many as 100 fighter aircraft overhead flying combat air patrol. Uh, luckily, this area is extremely heavily islanded, and by this point in the war, Virtually every island had air bases on it, and so uh, you didn't even need to deploy carriers. You could just use your aircraft to, uh, from these islands to escort your ships in the area. The Americans knew the Japanese had to resupply, and uh, there had been resupply missions in the past that had been attacked by aircraft, and these had been uh, moderately successful. The uh, heavy bombers at high altitude 
do not have much success sinking air, uh, sinking ships. Even slow moving transports uh, can usually maneuver out of the way of high level bombers. Uh, so past missions had been at least partially successful in resupplying the Japanese. Now the Americans start to see a major buildup at Rabaul. They start to increase their uh, reconnaissance flights to keep an eye on it. And uh, they already have, of course, broken Japanese codes, and they're also doing a lot of uh, signals intelligence work. Uh, so they, they find out that uh, in early March, the Japanese are going to do this resupply mission. So they start to put together a force of aircraft uh, to oppose uh, this mission. They come up with 55 fighter aircraft and 115 bombers of various types, heavy, medium, and light, uh, as well as 10 PT boats, uh, patrol torpedo boats, the so-called mosquito boats made by Elko uh, out of plywood with three big, beautiful Packard engines in them and each carrying four torpedoes. And at this point, a couple of 50 caliber and 20 millimeter guns. They haven't received any of the major upgrades they will later in the war. Uh, so this force has been fighting in the Southwest Pacific area for quite a while. And uh, so they've got experience, but some of the squadrons are short on air crew from uh, casualties and combat fatigue. Others, uh, their aircraft are just in bad shape and have low availability because they require so much maintenance after all of the use they've been put through in the last year or so. Uh, and so the Allies decide intentionally that they are going to cut back on air attacks uh, in early 1943 to try and fix and preserve as, much, as many as the air assets as possible uh, so they can defeat this convoy. Uh, and it's uh, relatively successful. They also start to look at, uh, hey, high-level bombing isn't working. What can we do as an alternative? And they come up with a couple of options. Uh, they start to mount heavy machine guns in the nose of some of their bombers. Uh, this way, instead of using their medium bombers as high-altitude bombers, uh, they can fill the bomb bays with fuel tanks uh, put all these guns in the nose and then just fly in low and fast at an enemy ship and shoot it up. Uh, typically, flying in low is far more dangerous than high-level bombing. Uh, it's difficult for a high-level bomber to hit a ship. It's equivalently difficult for a ship to hit a high-level bomber. Uh, when you fly in low, you often have to fly slow to also uh, release your ordnance. So this makes you a very easy target for anti-aircraft gunners. Going from dropping bombs to shooting machine guns out of the nose of your plane changes that equation significantly because now, uh, one, you're not coming in slow to line up for a bomb attack, and two, you're firing back at that ship uh, which makes it difficult for their gunners to shoot at you because they're all trying to take cover from your fire. Additionally, in Europe, the uh, British and Germans had both started practicing what's called skip bombing, where you fly in low and you basically pull the plane up and drop a bomb out of the bomb bay so that it skips across the surface of the water and slams into the side of a ship much more effective to punch a hole in the side of a ship than to drop a bomb above and punch a hole in the deck of a ship. Uh, one, instead of trying to hit the relatively narrow uh, deck of a ship, maybe 100 feet wide, you were throwing your bomb at the length of a ship, which is four, five, six hundred 600 feet wide and 40 feet hollow. Uh, so, much better chance of success, and unlike if you're coming in for a slow torpedo attack or something, uh, you can come in at pretty good speed and drop that bomb and kick out of there. Um, in addition to uh, 
uh, skip bombing. There was also masthead height bombing, which is very similar, except instead of trying to skip the bomb across the surface of the water, you come in as close to the enemy ship as possible uh, and then kick your bomb out and go. And uh, because your aircraft is flying at speed, the bomb doesn't drop straight down. It goes at an angle because it has the same speed as your aircraft. Uh, and so your bomb goes out diagonally and will hit the side of the ship without skipping across the water or anything else. Uh, and this masthead height bombing proved to be the most effective uh, or the more effective of the two techniques, although both were significantly more effective than high-level bombing. Uh, even though the Americans had really good bomb sites that they believed in, uh, these two techniques were, were much better. And as the Americans planned this mission, they also built in training time to practice these new techniques. Uh, and not to spoil the ending or anything, but the training, the preparation, the intelligence gathering, uh, it all came together into a well-executed mission that ended up being a huge Allied success. Um, these new tactics the Japanese were not prepared for. They hadn't seen this before, uh, so they couldn't develop counter tactics at that point. And um, all of these new tactics working together were even more effective than uh, if one or two had been deployed piecemeal over the course of several missions. So it turns out that the bombers coming in low and fast and machine gunning the target suppress the enemy anti-aircraft guns so that the following bombers that were using bombs coming in from multiple directions uh, were not being shot at as much. The enemy didn't have as many machine gunners. Uh, and because these planes were coming in in multiple directions and uh, launching a variety of attacks from different ranges, the Japanese defenses were confused and uh, they couldn't concentrate fire on any one incoming target. They were dispersing their remaining fire all over the place. Furthermore, because some of the planes hadn't been retrained or re-equipped for this new stuff, they were still doing high-level bombing. Uh, the high-level bombing can't hit the broadside of a barn, but it forced the convoy to disperse. So the ships were no longer in formation, mutually supporting each other with anti-aircraft fire. They're now all over the ocean and can be easily picked off. Uh, so all of these factors together worked out extremely well for the Allies uh, and basically forced the Japanese to stop transporting troops in convoys like this. Of the eight transport vessels, all eight were destroyed. Uh, of the eight escorting destroyers, four were destroyed and three were damaged. Uh, of the 6,900 troops, about 1,200 were rescued by destroyers and taking, taken to lay, uh, and about 2,700 were rescued by destroyers and returned to Rabaul. Uh, and the remaining half of the Japanese force was lost at sea. So Lay was not able to be reinforced, and it was not uh, able to be reinforced in that method in the future. Uh, so why did the Japanese try to use a convoy here in the first place? They basically only had the two options, convoy ships straight across or uh, convoy ships to New Guinea further up the coast, hopefully out of range of Allied aircraft, and then march their troops about 140 miles through swamps without roads. Uh, so it's no, uh, no surprise there that the Japanese didn't go with that option. Uh, in the future, they would have to take a very circuitous coastal route to drop off troops um, using smaller vessels. And so they were never able to get massed infantry into combat all at one time. Uh, the Allies could get convoys to New Guinea and the Southern Solomons uh, with mass troops and supplies in a timely manner. Uh, and so that concentration of force allowed them to win the Solomon Islands campaign and the New Guinea campaign simultaneously.
Let's see. Uh, so the Battle of the Bismarck Sea ended up taking place between March 2nd and March 4th. Uh, and as you can see, the Allied intelligence effort beforehand, the preparation, and the concentration of force all led to a successful victory. Because the Allies concentrated their forces uh, and all did, even though they were doing different things, uh, but because they were all hitting more or less at the same time, the Japanese were never able to recover from one attack and prepare for the next. And the different attacks degraded their defensive abilities as progressively weaker Allied attacks came in, uh, they were able to continue to score successes. Now, following this Allied success, the Japanese Army and Navy decided they needed their own success. So they come up with Operation I-Go, uh, and this would be performed just a month later, uh, April 1st to the 16th, uh, really more the 7th to the 16th, but uh, starting in early April, they start to uh, collect assets for this uh, operation. So IGO is basically the Japanese trying to do the same things. They now don't have sufficient force, so they want to uh, launch air attacks that will destroy Allied shipping, which will uh, allow them to get some breathing room before the next Allied attack so they can find a new way to bring their troops in. Uh, it is decided that the Imperial Japanese Navy will take point on this. Uh, so the Navy, uh, they have used most of their ships in and around Guadalcanal, and uh, this will not be a naval battle per se. Uh, Allied air forces in the area are too strong for the Japanese to commit any of their remaining naval assets, because uh, they might be able to get in at night and they might be able to win a night fight, although Allied radar and uh, night fighting techniques have improved significantly. Uh, but getting out, they're stuck in daylight and they will be destroyed by Allied aircraft. So they're going to do this purely with aircraft. And that's okay, because the Japanese Navy has huge uh, reserves of land-based and naval-based airplanes. At this point, many of their trained pilots have been lost in the fighting around the Solomon Islands and earlier campaigns, but they still have enough to pull off the mission. So in this battle, you won't see training as a significant detriment on the Japanese side uh, like you will later on. So the Japanese uh, get some 350 aircraft and they concentrate them all on Robao. So they're pulling aircraft from their other nearby uh, island chains because uh, honestly, those aren't under threat at the moment. All of the fighting is taking place in the Southwest Pacific, in the Solomon Islands. So it makes sense to concentrate your force in that one place uh, for the defense. Uh, of these 350 aircraft, about half are land-based planes. Uh, some of them are even medium bombers. The Japanese Navy operated land-based medium bombers. A, a lot of fighter escorts, uh, other aircraft. They also took the aircraft from their four local aircraft carriers. Rather than deploying their carriers and burning a bunch of fuel, uh, they just took the aircraft off uh, and operated them around the islands, which are unsinkable airfields, and are all close enough that uh, their, their aircraft had the range to operate from these islands successfully. So, first they concentrate all their aircraft on Rabaul, and then they disperse them around some of the local islands. Uh, they had to concentrate so they could uh, do whatever training and uh, preparation work was required, and they dispersed them so that the Allies couldn't get word of the attack and launch a counterattack. Allied intelligence is pretty good in the area. They've, uh, they know that an attack is coming, uh, but they are not able to counterattack, like I said. Uh, rather than use their bombers to try and disrupt the operation before it happens, they disperse their own bombers so they won't be caught on the ground uh, like earlier in the war, Pearl Harbor and in the Philippines. Uh, they are able to prepare their fighter defenses, though. 
So, uh, the Japanese, over the course of a little over a week, launch a series of major attacks, uh, starting out targeting Guadalcanal and then some of the other airfields around. Um, these attacks target both the airfields and the shipping in the area. They're trying to suppress Allied aircraft uh, and also to destroy ships bringing troops in. Uh, like I said, that would buy them the breathing time they need. Now, with the Allies prepared uh, and operating newer, more powerful fighters, the uh, Japanese do not have the aircraft advantage that they enjoyed earlier in the war. And now both sides are combat experienced. The Japanese do not enjoy the element of surprise, and they do not enjoy the training uh, edge that they had early in the war. Uh, so the series of air battles are fairly even, and uh, there's a lot of fighter combat that takes place during this time. And honestly, there aren't that many kills considering the number of aircraft involved. Uh, at the end of the operation, the Japanese claimed that they had destroyed 175 Allied aircraft and sunk 28 ships. In reality, they had destroyed 25 aircraft and five ships, mostly small minesweepers and a single destroyer, the uh, Aaron Ward. In return, the Japanese had lost 55 aircraft so about a seventh of the aircraft deployed. It's not significant, it's replaceable. Uh, the Allied losses are also extremely replaceable. So even though the Japanese claim comparative success, they do not enjoy any sort of success in this operation. Um, and the Allies are able to continue their advances basically unimpeded. Uh, Mid-April rolls around and the Japanese attacks stop and uh, that's that. The Americans continue and they're able to launch their next offensive and continue to supply everything going on in the area. Um, what did the Japanese do wrong? Well, they didn't concentrate. They attacked a series of American and allied positions around the area. Uh, one day they'd attack over here, a couple days later they'd attack over there, uh, and then a week later over here. Uh, they launched single large attacks comprised of multiple raids uh, or multiple wings coming in. Uh, these attacks were not large enough to overwhelm the Allied defenses, nor were they large enough to uh, inflict significant damage. Uh, and they never followed up. They launched the attack, and maybe they'd weaken the defenses some, but rather than attacking there again, they'd wait a couple days and attack somewhere else. And so the defenses were able to be repaired during that time, and units were able to shift around and meet new threats. Uh, and then furthermore, they had faulty intelligence uh, in that they weren't able to find out when major Allied convoys were coming in like the Americans had, so they weren't able to target anything specifically, uh, and they weren't able to do effective bomb damage assessment. So following the attacks, they come back and they report massive successes. Everybody says they shot down an enemy aircraft. Everybody says their bomb hit a target. This just isn't accurate. Uh, and so the Japanese thought it had been more successful than... Uh, it had actually been, having lost a seventh of the aircraft in the air crew committed, uh, Admiral Yamamoto called off the attack on the 16th. He thought it had succeeded in its mission and that he had bought the breathing time that uh, his forces needed. I mean, a good uh, officer trusts their men, uh, but in not questioning them uh, in more depth, the uh, amount of damage done was vastly exaggerated. The Japanese could have followed up with reconnaissance flights and uh, done more accurate bomb damage assessment, but they didn't 
have that ability nearly as well as uh, the Allies did. Uh, so, results of the battle. Further proof that the Allies can continue to re resupply their forces and the Japanese cannot. Uh, it will also result in the death of Admiral Yamamoto. We're going to see that in next week's video. Uh, it proves that uh, Allied planning and intelligence is better, and all of these factors will continue throughout the war, and the Allies are only going to get better, uh, and the Japanese, unfortunately, are only going to degrade as they lose more forces and more experience. So thanks for watching. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we put out new content. Uh, be sure to uh, check the comment section down below if you have any questions and uh, want to make any suggestions. Also check the description below for ways you can support the museum and uh, our YouTube channel. We intend to continue to put out daily videos uh, until Labor Day when the museum closes and staff are furloughed. Uh, and assuming we can raise the $20,000 with your help, we will continue to put out YouTube videos after that. Uh, if we are unable to raise sufficient money on Labor Day, these videos will probably end uh, for at least six months. Thanks for your continued support. I'll see you next time.